Good morning. Welcome to Hope First Baptist Church in this beautiful fall morning uh, as, as we come to worship our Lord and Savior today. Thank you for joining us online as, as we do worship today. Uh, a few quick announcements, uh, several announcements actually this morning. You'll notice in your bulletin uh, there's an insert again. We are collecting some items for the community center. So please take a look at that and, and have them here by next Sunday so we can get those to them. Uh, also out on the counter, uh, we're still collecting items for um, Operation Christmas Child. The packing party for that is in um, November, on November the 13th, so please plan on that. We are planning a, um, a fall cookout hayride out of the gathering fields on October 22nd at 6.30, so please keep that in mind and, and join us for a, a fun time out there. Uh, also coming up is Trunk or Treat. We will have that in, a, um, in accordance to whenever the town sets, sets their, uh, their trick or treat night. We will do it that night. Uh, we'll be needing hot dogs for that. So if you see a good deal, buy a package of hot dogs and bring them in. We'll put them in the freezer till we need them. Flag, flag football still going on. Still got a 50-50 rating. And, all right. So a few more weeks of that. Come out and, and enjoy them. Um, Thanksgiving suppers on November the 12th. At, uh, we're doing a drive-through um, pickup again on, on the meals. Uh, hope to have the, the menu what we need by next Sunday. Yeah, wake up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Need, need to get those out, and and so we'll we'll be doing probably about the same amount that we did last year, and so we'll, we'll plan on that. Um, yeah. Anything else? I don't think so. Okay. Will you join me in prayer this morning? Oh. Yeah, I do. I'm sorry. I do have one more announcement. Um, we've been praying for Mark Benzie for, for several months now from his, from his uh, terrible accident the, that he has. He is in a Greenwood Health Care Center. Um, still in bed, not able to get out of bed at, at all, uh, still facing more surgeries. Um, because of the, the length of it, he is uh, getting depressed or, or, or is depressed and, and, and facing a battle that way. His birthday is October the th 13th, October the 13th. And uh, David wishes that uh, he would be flooded with, with uh, cards, birthday cards, thinking of you cards, uh, just praying for you cards, just to let him know that people of, of his community love him and that God loves him. Um, I have a, a phone number. If you want to text him, happy birthday. I do have an address. It's at the Greenwood Health Care, room 232, uh, 377 Westridge Boulevard in Greenwood, 46143. But if you want to, to get a card, and give it to May or Daryl Jesse, they will make sure that he gets those cards in or around his birthday. So continue to, to pray for, for Mark as he continues to battle from back from this terrible accident. Now we'll go together in prayer, please. Our dear Heavenly Father, we, we do come to you this morning. We lift Mark up to you. Uh, we ask that you would give him encouragement I know it's been a long battle and, and continues to be a long battle, dear Lord. We just ask that you would continue to, to touch his body, that he may regain strength, dear Lord, that he may uh, eventually come out of the, the health care center, dear Lord, and, and return home. Dear Lord, we just pray uh, again for, uh, for his uplifting that you would touch him and touch him through the cards and, and the letters and that he might receive, that, that he would know that, that you're still there and, and people love him and are, are praying for him, dear Lord. We, we pray for others this morning that uh, are facing difficult situations. We, we pray for those that uh, are searching for jobs. We pray for those, dear Lord, that... Um, have difficulty uh, with family life, dear Lord, that you would intervene and, and dear Lord, that um, you would be with them, give them wisdom, encouragement, and, and the strength that they need to, to face whatever. We, we pray for, for Missy Tressler this morning as she continues her battle. We're, 
we're uh, anxious for her as she is anxious also, dear Lord, that, that uh, the treatments may begin, that uh, they would have a direction to go, that, that your power uh, may be shown through, through her healing process, dear Lord. We thank you for, for the many ways that you've worked in our lives. We thank you, dear Lord, for, for new jobs and, and new beginnings at new jobs, dear Lord. We, we thank you, dear Lord, for um, the promises that you give us through your love and, and through your word, dear Lord. We, we pray for, for Molly and Dennis as they're away this weekend visiting with Micah, dear Lord. We just ask your blessing upon them. And, and uh, through this time of transition, dear Lord, we just pray that, that you would be with them. And, and Micah, as, as he looks forward to his, his next assignment, um, be with, with Caleb also as, as he is transitioning to a, a new assignment also, dear Lord. Pray with those, pray for those, dear Lord, that um, whatever transition, whether it be moving, whether it be jobs, whether it be uh, health situations, just, just be with them. Dear Lord, we pray for Stephen this morning as he brings your word to us. May it enter into us. May we feel it. May we believe it. May we hear your word. And later, dear Lord, as we gather around your communion table, let your body and your blood be poured out for us that we may uh, glorify in you. We pray all of this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. From Romans chapter 15. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing your name. Again, it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples extol him. And again, in Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, and even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and the peace in believing, so that the power of the Holy Spirit may abound in you in hope. Amen. Will you stand with us this morning if you're able and sing with us. Surrender to the 
of every nation are awakening to sing from our hearts that comes an anthem oh hear the heavens ring this is our song
Yep, he's back. Yeah. <laughs> Told you I wasn't going to tell you the next time I was going to preach so that you guys wouldn't, you know, be sick, you know, to get that, that bug that's going around. You know. Now, a couple weeks ago, um, yeah, a couple, three weeks ago, I took you, or took us through a psalm um, that was supposed to reinforce our confidence in God. Right? If you remember, it was Psalm 46. It was supposed to give us the reasons why we should trust God with all of our being. And so today I wanted to complement that by taking you through a psalm that lays out the proper response. Singing. I'm glad that we are, at least for the sake of this Sunday, that we are a church that sings a little bit before the message is brought because that's what I want to talk to you about today, is singing and the role it plays in the kingdom of God. How many of you can come here and as you sing, maybe you didn't, don't even sing, but you just listen to the words and to the music, you feel a release. How many of you have come here under stress, under duress, and when you sing, there is a special power that is released that's different than the one you hear when the word is preached. How many of you say, yes, I can, I can feel the difference between the song and the word. Both we need. We need both. But they are different. And there is a, there's, you can't really even put it into words, the power that singing to God has in a heart that belongs to Christ. Amen. And so I wanted to take you through a psalm that is all about that, that is all about singing and the role it has to play in the kingdom. Now, this is a recurring theme. From Genesis to Revelation, singing is a constant theme in the Bible because song will succeed where words fail. Now, words are pretty far-reaching. Okay, we can, I'm the English major, remember, I'm the English teacher. Words can do a whole heck of a lot as far as describing truth. But when, you know, sometimes they just don't quite get it. I mean, you can say, yes, I've been there. Not just in life. Words just don't do it. Words don't cut it. Somehow, when combined with music, they become something deeply powerful. So I'm going to take you to Psalm 149 and give you a little info, insight into it. Psalms 146 to 150 are the conclusion of the entire book of Psalms. There's, they were placed specifically by the ancient editor of the book of Psalms at the end because they are Psalms strictly of praise. They're not laments. They're not asking God questions. They're just praising him. Now, each gives a different reason, a different cause of praise, but they are all bookended with the same phrase. Praise Jehovah and praise Jehovah. They come at the beginning of every Psalm, 146 to 150. They begin with praise Jehovah and they end with praise Jehovah. But this particular one, Psalm 149, underscores the real power that singing has in the Christian life. 
the real power that it does, that it has in the kingdom. So let's read it through first. I want you to hear it and imagine this being sung. Okay, because it's we're so far removed from ancient Hebrew culture, we sometimes forget this is a hymn book. This is the ancient Israelites' hymnal. Uh, com- many of them composed over centuries, and they finally got edited together into the common, you know, into a standard hymnal for the Hebrews. And so this is sung. Now it would sound far different their music than ours today, but it is sung. And there would be a Levite, a choir of Levites in the temple who sometimes would sing it all. Sometimes would there be a call and response and they would represent the people. And then there would be one solo singer who would do the call and they would respond. So imagine this being sung. Psalm 149. Oh, and fun fact. So when it says, many of you may know this, but when you see the Lord in small caps, yeah, that is, that means that in the Hebrew text, God's name, his covenant name, his actual name, Yahweh, is being used. Now, we, I think we have a, we've lost a sense of how holy God held his name. Um, in Hebrew culture, well, when you prayed, you, cover, or you uncovered your head, similar to how we would remove our hats, right? Uh, gentlemen, remove your hats. You know, we do it for the anthem. We do it when we pray. The Hebrews did it too. But when you said God's name, you covered your head again. You did not have any, you did not, you needed a barrier between you and God when you invoked his name. Not, not saying God, when you said his name, Yahweh. And you didn't say it just for no reason. You did not, uh, when it says take the Lord's name in vain, we often think of using it as a curse word. But that, that's bad, and that's true. But what that meant to the Hebrew is you just didn't use it every day. You didn't use it in your casual conversation. Because this is the eternal one of the universe we're talking about. God of Jacob. So when you said his name, you covered your head. Right? Lest, lest you be struck by him. That's the idea. So you covered your head again. And so when it says the Lord, they, all, they didn't even write it all the way out. They just put the first syllable, Yah. So for the, for the purposes of the psalm, we're going to say Jehovah whenever it says that. Fun fact, Jehovah is actually, that's nowhere in the Bible a name of God. It's actually a mistranslation of an old Hebrew text that says Yahweh. So I think it's a good of referring to God's name without actually using it. So we're going to say Jehovah. I, I prefer to use that when it says the Lord. And that was a little, little side note there. So let's get into the psalm. Praise Jehovah. Sing a new song to the Lord and his praise in the congregation of the godly ones. Israel shall be joyful in his maker. The sons of Zion shall rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing. Let them pray, sing praises to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will glorify the, uh, he will beautify. This is, okay. I asked her to put NAS up there, and this is a different translation. I thought I pulled it up, so I'm going to read from up here. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will glorify the lowly with salvation. The godly ones shall be jubilant in glory. They shall sing for joy on their beds. The high praises of God shall be in their mouths and a two-edged sword in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their dignitaries with shackles of iron, to execute against them the judgment written. This is an honor for all of his godly ones. Praise Jehovah. It begins by invoking his name. That's the important part. And so you know this was serious business when you said God's name. Now it says, sing to the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of the godly ones. 
I want you to hear, you've heard this before, haven't you? Sing to the Lord a new song. And you, you kind of hear it. It's one of those phrases, those buzz phrases in, Christian, in the Christian faith. But you don't actually think about it sometimes. But this is not just, hey, let's sing to the Lord. Get, you know, get out your hymnal and pick your favorite hymn. This is sing him something new. Whatever act God just did that we're thanking him or praising him for in this song, it is not merely worthy of a good old song. This deserves something new. Something that has never been sung before because he has done something so wonderful. We need to find new words, new notes to put this to. Something to take away from this. God gives this a lot in his word. Sing to the Lord a new song. God delights, church, in the multiplicity, there's a word, multiplicity, of and the variety of praise. He delights in old songs, but he delights in new songs too. So sing, never, never get so stuck singing the same old songs that you forget to sing God a new song every now and then. Now it says, godly ones. That's us. So this was Israel at first. Israel was God's chosen people and nobody else was God's people at the time. So when this was written, it was meant to address the Israelites. I let the congregation of the Israelites here at the temple, here present in Jerusalem, sing. But praise be to God, we are now God's people too, amen? We have been grafted in to the vine. To the, is, to the vine of Israel. We are the people of God too, so let us not forget that this includes us. Let us sing a new song to God. And I also want you, three things to take away. This is the third one. It says congregation. This is big, and I think it's especially important in America today, where we tend to be very fond, at least pop culture, is very fond of private faith. You can believe what you want to. That's fine. You, know, you have a perfect right. But don't bring it out into the open and think you're going to force it on anybody else. All right? Don't say what you believe out loud because you might offend somebody. Listen to, look at, this is a particular word it uses, in the congregation. This is a group of people in a public setting. This is a public not a private praise. While singing to God and our faith may always be personal, it is never private, as Andy said last week on the square. It is public faith, and we are to praise together. I think sometimes we in the American church think of sun coming to church on Sunday as, oh, I'm coming to praise the Lord, me, and there just happen to be other people. You know, it's more efficient for all of us to come together and praise God individually as a group. We have one central location, but that's never how the Bible puts it. We come together as one unit, relying, trusting in God for everything. We are meant not to just praise on our own next to your brother and sister. We're meant to praise and pray with our brothers and sisters. It is a blessing. How many of you feel it when you come and sing with everybody here? You can sing in your own, you know, on the, as you're driving, and that has a power too. But this is something special because it was meant to be. Sing to the Lord a new song in the congregation of his godly ones. Come together and sing. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the sons of Zion rejoice in their king. Okay. This is an, a good example of the then and now. Okay, so then this was Israel. They were called to rejoice in their maker then. But I, you've heard me say this before. Whenever you see Zion in scripture, think of the greater Jerusalem to come. Jerusalem was God's city during, you know, pre-Christ. Uh, pre okay. That is where he dwelt. But it was supposed to figure, prefigure the new kingdom. 
when Christ will return again and establish his everlasting throne. That's Zion. So we are citizens of Zion. So whenever it says Zion, sometimes, yeah, it's referring to Jerusalem, but in a bigger sense. We, too, are called to rejoice, not just in our maker, but look at how the, it changes. Our king. I don't know. Any Lord of the Rings fans in here? I, if you are, you're welcome here. I, I, love, I love you. I'm, I, am, I am a Lord of the Rings fan, right? And there's a special joy that comes when the king finally returns. This happens in all sorts of old tales. When the lost king finally returns to the throne, there is singing, flowers are blooming, and peace and harmony, it's restored, and there is a great joy. That is the picture here. The king has come back to Zion. Do you not think we will be singing when the king returns? Why, why wait until then? Because we know it's a sure thing. It's going to happen. So let's start singing now. How, I think it would be wonderful, and I like to think this is going to happen, that Christ will return when every one of his people living on earth are singing. And that may not be, but it will be. Uh, we'll find out I'm right on that day. <laughs> I think we're going to be singing when Christ comes back. And we're not going to stop. Because we're already singing. We'll just keep on singing. There's going to be a whole heck of a lot of singing those days. Now, in a lot of translations it says sons. And this is where some woke people may be like, oh, that's, that's gender exclusive there. And some say children. Because we are brothers and sisters after all. We are sons and daughters of Christ. But it never uses sons in that kind of way. It is uses, whenever the scripture uses sons, there's a reason. Because sons inherited in these days, in this culture. So when it says sons, women, sisters in Christ, when it calls you a son of God, be, don't be offended. Be glad. Because what it's saying is you are an inheritor of Zion itself. Alongside every man in this congregation, every woman too is a son, an inheritor of the kingdom. There's nobody left behind. There's nobody who gets the short end of the stick. We all inherit Zion together. Oh, is that cause to sing, church? We are all sons of Zion. We have rights, every one of us, Every Christian throughout all the ages and ages to come has the rights of a firstborn son. Oh my goodness. Let them praise his name with dancing. Let them sing praises to him with timbrel and lyre. All right. Praise his name. We hear that often too. And it's just another one of those Christian buzz phrases we often don't think about. But we need to stop and remember how important names were in ancient times and especially in Near Eastern culture. Today in America, we, name, we give somebody a name because it sounds nice. You know, sometimes it's not even real English. It's made gibberish or something like that. And we just, it's not pretty, so we name our son or daughter that. And that's fine, you know, whatever. But names were not that flippant. Israel did not, the Israelites did not do that when they named their children. Names were much more important. They were a token of your very identity. So when we praise God's name, we are praising him. In fact, all that he is. When God says his name, even when this text says his name, it is talking about the very sum total of his being. We are praising his name. What is his name? Yahweh, Jehovah. We're praising that. All that he is and all that that name represents. We're praising his reputation, his faithfulness, his power. We are praising everything, every single aspect about him because that is what your name stood for in those days. What a, what, gosh, what a... Would it change culture if we started naming our kids with intention, you know, as like a blessing, 
And I'm sure people do it. I mean, people do it all the time. It's just not a common practice. But what if we named our kids as if it were a blessing over their entire life? Wouldn't that be wonderful? That'd be, I'd be interested to see how, what would change if we did that as a cultural norm. Well, people did it then because the name was you. When we praise God's name, we're praising him at his very core. Let him praise his name with dancing. Yes, Baptists, dancing. I, I debated whether or not to even address this the verse, you know, because we're in a Baptist church. But yes, the Bible says that you dance. And I, and last Christmas, I uh, preached on, the, on Mary's song, right? And she was talking about dancing like a fool before the throne. David got all but half naked uh, when dancing like a fool in praise of God, right? You are called to dance. Now, I don't expect you to be, you know, you know, doing square dances in church or anything like that, or, you know, you know, doing all these weird motions. We don't have to be doing that in church, but we are not called to be statues before the throne of God. We are dancing like idiots in front of God because he's good reason to look like an idiot. All right? How many of you men, the only time you probably ever danced in your life was when you married your wife and you had to get up on the dance floor because it's just a tradition, right? I, I see some tender looks uh, between some husbands and wives here, right? Some men, I, I promise you, I will be one of them. Um, I, the last time, I, I don't even remember the last time I danced. I am, it would be an ugly sight, you know, and you just don't. <laughs> I, I have no, Dennis says he has no sense of rhythm when it comes to song or to keeping a beat. It is on that way with dancing. Uh, so as Dennis says, when we get there, you'll all find that I have the best dancing, you know, and you'll all be looking to me because I will be made anew and I will actually finally have an dancing moves to speak of. So, well, I await that day with anticipation, right? But some men, I, I'll be one of them. You don't dance until you have to. And when you marry your wife, you have to, right? It's a good reason, though, to dance. I imagine most men, if you're like that, you didn't begrudge getting on the dance floor with your wife. You were looking forward to it. Why? Because you love her. She is good reason to, even if you can't dance, she's reason enough to get out on that dance floor in front of all these people and look like a fool. That's the imagery that's going on here. Is God not reason enough to dance like a fool? To look silly for once? Even if everyone else giving you the eye, like, oh, this guy, you know, a little early to be drinking, wouldn't you say? No, it's reason to look foolish before God. He's just that great, and he's that good. So yes, Baptists, there is dancing before the presence of God. Timbrel, that's the tambourine. Lyre, that's the handheld harp. The modern equivalent, let's say, would be the drum set and the guitar. Really, that's, that's the modern equivalent of this. So we've got that down. So let's keep that up, First Baptist Church of Hope. We got the drums and we got the guitar. So that's good. The Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the afflicted ones with salvation. Very important verse. This song divided in half and this is the end of the first half I've said it before and I'll say it again when you say when you see the word for you need to stop and reread what you just read for is a conjunction that shows the reason okay I put on my coat for I was cold that sounds like an ancient a cold, an old way of saying it but it's still proper English the reason you put on your coat was because you were cold. For gives the reason. Why are we singing with timbrel and with lyre? Why are we dancing like idiots? Why are we singing to the Lord a new song? For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. And he will beautify the afflicted ones with salvation. Stop and hear it again. Jehovah, there it is, that's his name, his covenant name. Jehovah himself takes pleasure in his people. 
Is that not a staggering fact in and of itself? When you really give it a good thought. Okay, let me ask you a question. On a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you do that by right should please God? How many of you are at uh, number 10? How many of you are you know, saying, yes, every action and word I do ever in life has only ever been to please God? I'm just trying to see which one of you all are the prideful ones, who are the Pharisees in here, right? No. How, anybody at a 7? A C? You know, C range? Eh, you know, I, I please God a little bit in everything I've done. How many of you are at rock bottom, would you say? Yeah. I'd say that on the scale of 1 to 10, all of humanity ranks pretty low on pleasing God with what we do and say by our own rights. And yet, and yet, Jehovah takes pleasure in his people. By his own choice, he chose to take pleasure in you. Enough pleasure to save you, to give you a gift that pleases him. All right? He can't look at us by our own right. We don't do anything that pleases him. When we're born in Adam, we don't. We're born outlaws. But he loved us so much and took pleasure in humanity so much that he went upon that horrid construction right there which was the only way he could have gotten us back. He got us back. So that he was the only human who ever pleased God 100%. On a scale of 1 to 10, he was 12, right? He gave you that scale. When God looks at you, he sees Christ because Christ loved you enough, took enough pleasure in you to come down and go through it all. And not only that, he gives you his spirit, which is working capital. Now you can do things that actually do please God. He sees Christ, and he sees the things you can do now that actually please him. And he loves it. He takes pleasure in his people. That is cause to sing. And he will, this is more important, in my, in my opinion. He will beautify the afflicted ones with salvation. That word, the afflicted ones, I don't know, is it up? The humble. Yeah. The Lord takes the lowly. That word is actually a Hebrew word for humble. Dennis has spoken on the word humble before. Do you remember? It refers, it's the same root word as uh, the bit in a horse. When you're humble, you could rebel, but you don't. You submit to the authority of Christ. That's the idea of humble. Now, how will he make you beautiful? He's going to give you, church, salvation. All right, gospel alert right here. This is perhaps the most beautiful line in this whole psalm, so I'm going to take a minute on it. All right, look at that verse. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. Let me ask you this. Were you, if God beautifies you, were you beautiful before? If he has to beautify you, does that mean you were beautiful before he began? No, it wasn't. Oh, so I guess since you realize that, I suppose you just bucked up and made the most of yourself and made yourself beautiful, right? That how that worked? Who made you beautiful? How did he make you beautiful? Look at what is being admitted here. Salvation is what makes you beautiful. If you were not beautiful before then, what does that mean that you could not procure for yourself? Mm. Church, God saved you from death, judgment, and ruin when you couldn't save yourself. When it would have been easy enough for him to forsake us to our fate. Dennis says this all the time, and I love it so much, I'm going to quote him. God was in heaven without you and didn't like it. 
right? A third of the angels, which are a hundred times more glorious than we are, and sing a whole lot better than we do. I can get a few amens and nods to that, right? A third of the angels fell and he didn't bat an eye. Even the most glorious. The one he bestowed with the most beautiful voice and mind in the universe other than his rebelled and left heaven and refused to sing and give glory to God. And he didn't care. But one man and one woman rebel and he banks, bankrupts heaven to get him back. Church, is it too much to ask you to sing before God your king? In the face of all that he has done, don't you think he's worthy of a song? I just love it when there's just even a sentence where you can find the gospel because it's worth chewing on and it's worth singing about. All right. That was the first stanza. Now the second stanza stanza does something odd that we might not expect. And I'll summarize it with this, because Dennis has preached on this before. Worship is warfare. And that's where this second stanza goes. Let the godly ones exult in glory. What glory? What did we just talk about? Salvation. The glory of salvation and dwelling in Zion with God. May we, they're asking God, may we exult in that. Let them sing for joy in their beds. All right, the godly ones, that's us again. To exult, I looked it up for you, Sheila. To feel or show triumphant elation or jubilation. Now you may have to look up elation too, but that, that's another time. To feel or show elation, that's utter joy and jubilation. That's to exult. May we feel that. And singing in bed. This is an interesting phrase. If you're singing in bed, what are you not doing? You ain't sleeping. Listen to what this is saying. You are too excited to sleep. All you can do is sing. I like to think of when you were a kid on Christmas Eve. Could you sleep? No. If you were like me, it wasn't even because of the gifts you were anticipating. Or not only, it's because you might catch Santa in the act, right? You might actually catch a glimpse of him, right? And doggone it, he always manages to come when you're asleep, right? But for a while there, a good two hours, much to the chagrin of your parents, you could not fall asleep. You were too excited to sleep. That's what's going on here, folks. You're singing in bed. You ain't sleeping. Nobody got time for sleeping in God's kingdom. You're too busy singing. Salvation is so glorious in the daylight, it provokes singing in the darkness. You're singing when night falls, awaiting the sun to rise again. Beautiful picture, isn't it? Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. I'm going to take the rest of the psalm, or at least almost the rest of it. To execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute on them the judgment written. This is very odd. It may not be intuitive to our minds. Look at what's supposed to happen at the same time that we are singing. This is war imagery right here. We are to be avenging the kingdom of God upon its enemies. It doesn't sound like your Sunday coming in together and singing our songs we did on Sunday. It doesn't sound like we're making war upon the enemies of God. In fact, making war, being rebellious like that or anything, that doesn't sound like something Christians should be really doing. Oh, but it is. Praising God and making war upon his enemies go hand in hand. You might even say they're one and the same. At that time, at the time this was written, this, this was a song for Jerusalem. And it often, when it says a two-edged sword, it often meant the literal sword. Because anyone who came up against Israel as an army to try and overthrow the kingdom was coming up against God. And God made that perfectly clear. Not only to the Israelites, but to the enemy when he vanquished them. 
When you came up against God's people, you were coming up against God. So they literally had to take up the sword. We ain't doing that today, and with good reason. What, quote unquote, two edged sword do we have today to make war upon God's enemies? We have the sword of the Spirit, which is, as we know, sharper than any two edged sword. We have the Spirit of God Himself within us. That's more powerful than any weapon. The Israelites didn't have that privilege. The Spirit only indwelled people, prophets, at certain times to do certain tasks. He did not dwell in the people, He dwelt in the temple. Church, we have God Himself in each and every one of us. We have His Word with us always. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Look at it. You can see it all through Scripture in Ephesians 6. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Hebrews 4, for the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. What real sword can do that? No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom we must give account. Or in Revelation, in his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. God's word is with us, and it's the weapon we use when the enemy hurls countless lies, distractions, and temptations at us. God's word is the only weapon that can not only withstand it, but can kill the enemy in mid-strike. Because it reveals wrong and proclaims truth. Never, never, never underestimate the word of God. It is the only sure and enduring thing we know of. It is in God's word that the judgment of evil is written. What, let me ask you this, what better vengeance could we have upon the enemies of God than to read them their death sentence from scripture? Or what better joy than to get defectors from the kingdom of darkness over to the kingdom of God by preaching to them the gospel written, the judgment that was written and ordained for Christ so that we could be his. What better vengeance than to get defectors and read to those who won't defect their death sentence? Oh, what greater victory to have over Satan than to say, enough, Satan. You want to know what you're headed for? You want me to remind you what you're headed for? God's word. Never underestimate the power of God's word. There is nothing... Some people feel almost guilty about reading those verses in Revelation where the saints are before his throne asking, when, oh, when, God, will you avenge our blood, the martyrs? There is nothing wrong or evil about anticipating the time when all evil will be stopped and all evildoers get what they deserve. It is a time of great joy and triumph. You think we'll be singing then? Oh boy, will we be singing then. No need to hate people now. It's better yet to preach the good news to them and win them over to the kingdom and bolster our numbers, so to speak. But there is nothing wrong with longing for the time when right will win finally and wrong will be punished. And it's coming quickly. Amen? All of this, making war upon upon God's enemies while you're singing, what is it to us? It tells us this is an honor for all his godly ones. Worship after Christ returns again, will be just pure joy. Worship now, before he's come again, is a battle cry. 
It is our battle cry. Think of David slaying Goliath, right, to honor God's reputation among the nations. That's what we're doing now when we come together and sing. We're making war upon the kingdom of darkness. I can't think of a better way to spend my time until I die than to make war upon the kingdom of darkness. And then, last word again, or the last line, praise Jehovah. What are we supposed to be doing during the war? Singing. Because worship is the most deadly weapon against the enemy. Even more powerful than the word. Why? Because it not only makes us strong, but it directly thwarts the enemy's plan. The plan from the beginning. I, he knows he can't get the glory for himself. That's a lost cause. So he's just spending his... There's Okay, I'm an English major. I love poems. I know I'm weird. Right? But there's this old epic poem called Paradise Lost, written by a man named John Milton. And the most interesting figure in that whole epic is Satan. Because he writes an epic about the fall of Satan. There's a section of the epic poem, very long, where it covers the fall of Satan. And Satan's talking to himself about what he's going to do about it now that he's fallen from heaven. And it, it's a beautiful way of looking into the psychology behind Satan. He knows he can't get the worship. He knows what he's doomed for. So, but he ain't going to give it back to God. Forget that. He's going to spend the rest of his existence diverting it from God. That, that's ugly when you think about it. But when you sing it thwarts his very purpose for existing. You, when you give worship to God, it does the one thing Satan cannot stand. And it makes him the most powerful enemy we have, weak and utterly impotent. Song in general. I look at any war movie. Okay, but The defining moment. What happens before the defining moment? They go into battle. Mostly, they sing. I can think of a bunch. Of the, I don't know if you've seen the movie Glory, right? The first real black regiment to fight in the United States Army in the Civil War. Think about what was at stake for them in this war. They had much more to fight for than their white counterparts. And in the moment, they're going to be the first regiment that charges the fort in battle. And they know casualties are going to be heavy. The night before, they're singing. And it's the most powerful and tender moment in the whole movie. There's another one where 4,000 Zulu warriors, African warriors, are besieging this little band of 100 British soldiers. And they've done attack after attack, and they finally come again. And the Zulus are crying their own war song. Ah, we're going to kill y'all. And the few British that are left just start singing a Welsh war song. And in that moment, it's the defining moment of the battle. The Zulus charge head on, and they're able to withstand them. And after that, the next time they see the Zulus, the Zulus are saluting them as fellow braves, and they let them be to, as, a, as a token of honor. Singing has power, even when it's not to God. Singing, song in general, has power. But when you invoke God's name and you give him the praise he was... He's, do since the creation of the universe, that is a power that the world has not seen. You can see it in action. In Second Chronicles, when Jehoshaphat is going to go up against a foreign army, and God says, just sing. Just sing. And so they sing their little Israel hearts out. And when they get to the enemy, they've all killed themselves. They've just gone berserk and they've got turned on each other and the whole army's dead and there ain't no war to fight because they sang to God. How about Paul and Silas, huh? They've just been beaten. They've got their feet in the stocks, in prison, no hope in sight. And they just say, you know what? You know what, Sigh, Let's sing a hymn. And they do. And what happens? There's an earthquake and the whole darn jail comes down and everybody's free, but they don't escape. They don't take their freedom. They sit and listen to Paul and Silas. And the very jailer himself comes to Christ because they sang a hymn. Jesus and the disciples, 
This is an often overlooked fact, but after they ate bread and drank the wine on Maundy Thursday, they sang a hymn. And Jesus then went into the garden and prayed that fateful prayer. But they sang a hymn before Jesus started that long and lonely road of crucifixion. The martyrs, you can, most of the martyrs, when they were, they were executed in ancient days, they were singing as they went. And it was the witness of that. People sitting in the stands, watching Christians get slaughtered for entertainment by wild animals and gladiators and all sorts of things. Seeing these people singing as these rock lions are coming upon them made them think, what have they got? And that is what made the kingdom spread like wildfire in the Roman Empire, singing to God in a time of trouble. The Moravians, John Wesley was on a ship headed for America, I believe, or was on a ship headed somewhere, I don't remember. The storm was raging, and he was not, at this time, Christian. And he thought, we're going to die. And he went below deck, and there was a group of Moravians fit, fitting for hope, singing to God. And John Wesley said, what have they got? And we all know John Wesley by name today in the Christian church. One more, I wanted to share this with you because I find it so powerful. As a pastor I listen to often named John Piper, you may have heard of him as well, but he was telling a story in one of his sermons of when he was green as a preacher. First started out, he got a call from these college students, and they were telling him, listen, we've got a possessed woman in the apartment next to us. And he thought, well, I have never, never dealt with this before. I don't know what the heck to do. I'll just take a copy. I'll take the Bible, because I know you preach. I know you, you recite the word to the demon. That, that usually works. So he goes, and this, I'm, they, this woman was berserk, was acting crazy, and the kids were saying, this is not her. It's not her voice. She's doing things she cannot do. This is serious business. John Piper started to read from the word, and she, the possessed woman, would knock it out of his hands. He'd pick it back up and try to read, and she would knock it out of his hands. And this went on for a long time. And she was armed with a, a pocket knife, too. Finally, somebody just started to sing a simple alleluia over and over, and everybody soon was joining in. And she went nuts. I keep doing this. They started singing. And she went nuts, absolutely ballistic, started screaming for Satan not to leave her, started convulsing, and finally she collapsed and was still. And he thought they'd killed her. But she came to, and the demon had left her. Because it's the one thing you cannot stand, is when God gets the glory. Sing, church, sing. You do not realize how powerful a weapon it is. It's the most offensive maneuver we can use against the, the darkness. If despite all that the enemy throws at you to get you to run from the faith, to get you to deny Jesus, if in spite of all of that, you sing to God, then he has nothing he can use against you. He has nothing on you, utterly and completely impotent. All he has left, the only course he has left, is to kill you. So what? Then I'll be singing forever in the presence of God. And it may just be that if he kills me, somebody sees it and says, what did they have that I don't? And will come to know Christ. So church, to put it, to coin a phrase, for God's sake, sing. Sing for God. To close, I want us to sing the final hymn of Psalm. Well, sing, we won't sing it. We'll recite it. All right? I have it up in Psalm 150. I have it now in the New Living Translation because I like the way it words it better. All right, so here's how we're going to do it. When you see me do this, that means to repeat back what I just read. And when you see me point at you, that's to say the next line. Right? Not the next verse, just the next line. Right? I just want us to sing. This is a, a, a hymn strictly about singing. And I think after all God has done for us and knowing just how powerful singing is, we should sing it together. Right? Praise Jehovah. Praise Jehovah.
Now, now hang on, hang on. I know we're Baptists, but I think we need to bolster the reputation that we Baptists have. You need to give me it louder than that. All right. Praise Jehovah. Praise Jehovah. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him for his mighty works. Praise him with a blast of the ram's horn. Praise him with the tambourine and dancing. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Let everything that breathes sing praises to God. Praise Jehovah. Amen, church. Amen. May we never cease our song before the throne of God. Let's pray. God, we're Baptists. Sometimes we admit it's just not in our culture to sing and look at in the slightest bit foolish before anybody else when we're in the congregation of godly ones. But God, we ask that you so impress upon our hearts your goodness and your worthiness that we would feel no shame or inhibition at ever singing of it, singing of your goodness and your worthiness. Make us fall so in love with who you are that our song never stops. May we go to our death singing. May we spend every day of our waking lives singing. Even if only in our hearts, may we be singing your name because yours is the glory and the kingdom and the power forever and ever. Amen. On that note, let's sing.